What's up guys, it's Stephen Spikes here with the Spike Signal, and today I'm coming to talk to you guys about one of my favorite melodic death metal songs. It's Omnium Gatherum, New Dynamic. Going to be going through some of the things and underscoring why this song is so awesome, so sick, and so beautiful from a standpoint of music theory. So stay right here, this is coming up next on the Spike Signal. So just a couple things to kind of make sense of before we get into it. There are two lines here, primarily this line right here, which is not part of the actual song. This line, and I've called it implied chords, is simply there to show us what, in my opinion, the guitars and the bass are implying in terms of chord forms, forms throughout the entire song. And what an implied chord is basically all it is is when you have a conglomeration of notes together, you might be able to lump all those notes even from desperate things like a lead guitar, a rhythm guitar, and a bass guitar into certain chord forms altogether. So that's what this line is. And I'll continually be referencing that throughout the duration of this video. Along with that, I also have within each chord form, like for example, this first bar, in my opinion, they're implying a C-sharp minor chord. I also have written here in the lead chord, and I also have it in the pads as well, written in here, what extensions are being placed off that and played off that chord. And I've included the actual notes of the triad in there as well. In this case, the extension would be two. And then the one, the flat three, and the five actually comprise the triad. I've also done something similar, as can be seen right here, with the pad or stringed instruments. One more thing to keep in mind is within the key of C sharp minor, I have noted what the interval is implied based off of what chord is being played. So for example, the interval for C sharp minor in the key of C sharp minor is one, and the interval for F sharp minor within the key of F sharp minor is four. Getting right on with it, the first thing I wanna talk about is just very the very intro of the song. Nothing too crazy is going on here. I just wanna talk about some chords that Omnium Gatherum is implying to create the feel of the song that they have. Now, this very first bar right here is comprised of nothing other than pads and a lead guitar right here. Now, I'm implying this to be C sharp minor, and my argument for that is basically that you have three, along with an extension, the three notes of the triad that create C sharp minor itself, as well as a pad playing the flat three of C sharp minor, which is kind of interesting, gives kind of a cool sort of aesthetic for things. Likewise, the very next bar is also shown here. F sharp major implied, that's the four, four of C sharp minor. You can see here I'm drawing that argument based off of what is implied, based off of the solo guitar. So, you know, just kind of running over it quickly, Basically, in the first four bars, you have what looked purely based off of the lead guitar, except for this line right here that has some rhythmic stuff. You have a chord progression that pretty much follows within C sharp minor, one, four, one. This should say C sharp minor as well right here. And then uh, six, I'm sorry. And then flat seven right here. That's the intro. Now, like many, many, most in fact metal songs, significant amount of time is spent revolving around the tonic of the minor chords that is the aeolian mode another way to put it this song is no exception you see right here during the rhythmic part you have nothing but the tonic of c sharp minor over and over again with a little bit of you know kind of flair and embellishment here just to make things a little more interesting and exciting the bass guitar, as can be seen, follows suit right here, using a little bit of embellishment and playing along with the rhythm guitar to add a little bit of movement and excitement with the heavy, repeated, percussive, palm-muted hits. Now, one thing that I actually didn't notice at all until I was looking over this song to do this analysis video was that right along here, let me see if I can zoom into that some, right along here, Omnium Gatherum actually adds a little bit of variation up at the lowest string just to give a little more kind of pizzazz and flair to this line that they've repeated a couple times by now. This is one of those things that really points out, even though you might not hear it 
when you're first listening to it or even like, you know, on your hundredth listen of the song, like I'm probably on, I didn't notice till I was looking at it, but I probably somehow, you know, call it subconscious or whatever else picked up that something else was going on here and thus was a lot more kind of intrigued and engaged and interested in listening to the song simply because there was some unique stuff and some flair added right here. Uh, the pad seems to still be out of it. The bass guitar is still going strong, doing a little bit of variation. We then get into the portion where it is the lead line is introduced back into the rhythmic section. So you have all this stuff going here. Still, the same chord forms are implied. You go from the 1 to the 4. In this case now, it looks like we're moving a little bit. Finally, here moving on to the first verse, we see that there's a significant use of pedal tones. Very, very a typical, very often used quality of melodic death metal. And I feel like also genres like metalcore, to have a significant amount of pedal tones, kind of keeping the beat and everything as individual lines are hit. No harmonies yet going on with the guitars. It's all just straight notes right here. Once again, though, we see similar implications as what was shown before. C sharp minor, the one, moving to the four. F sharp minor, but now because of what's going on in the pedal tones primarily, we have a little bit of movement. We're now moving up to the flat six, which always, you know, to me, moving from kind of an Aeolian type minor sound to a flat six or a Lydian sound, depending on who you're talking to, always gives a great amount of empowerment and excitement to any song that you might be listening to. Just want to see what the pads are doing right here. It looks like they're still out of the song according to this tab. So uh, we continue on. We go to the flat seven. So from the from the one to the four to the flat six to the flat seven, that kind of movement ending on the flat seven especially really pulls the song forward and really engages you and gets you interested in hearing what is coming next in the song. And in this case, it's a little more of the verse, same sort of stuff. Uh, not much variation based on what I can see, although they do have a few things they do to change up the verses later on as the song continues. So that will certainly be coming in time moving on to the pre-chorus a very very nice one for sure we have uh, several things going on i've annotated here kind of specifically what's going on just to give us a little more things to look at basically i would say that this verse more or less is kind of written revolving around the flat six uh, you might say it's written in lydian mode but at this point there's not an overuse of the flat four so, you know, I, I might be a little guarded about saying that, but nonetheless, it is definitely pushing from the flat six. So the progression is really cool, very driving, a lot of accents on things. We're moving from the flat six to the flat seven to the one. Then what I hear when I listen to the song, it's kind of hard to tell because some, some of the tabs I saw had different stuff on it. And depending on what side, what guitar I'm listening to, whether the left guitar or the right guitar, I honestly feel like I'm hearing a little bit of different things. But I personally think that once the one is hit, just for a, for a moment, the guitar jumps up to the flat three quickly, just to give like a little bit of balance as it returns to the flat five and eventually, or I'm sorry, the flat seven and eventually the flat six to kind of return to where they are at as the pre-chorus started. This continues onwards one more time and just want to see if the pads are doing anything interesting right now it looks like they're still off the oh no they do have something going on right here actually they're accenting what's going on with the chords up top just playing basically power chord versions of what's going on here inverted though very important to note that things are inverted to make them sound just a little bit different a little more interesting and such we now move on to the part of the song that has a lead line in it, uh, just kind of a basic lead line. One thing that struck me about this was perhaps not quite here, but some part portions of their lead lines, like here is a good example, and here as well, focus very heavily on playing the chord tones in the solo itself. So, for example, for uh, this line right here, What's being played is a flat 7, that's a B major chord. This whole bar right here, it has focus on the 1 and the 3 of that chord. It also has a 4th in there as well, so it's not strictly the chord tones, but it is two elements of the triad with only one element outside of the triad. This gives the song a tremendous amount of unity and cohesion within the melody and is very important to do 
if you're going to be having a song with lots of complicated parts going on. And as we'll see just coming up in a little bit, it definitely gets to that fashion with all the tapping and other things that are added into the mix. So that's what's going on here. So we move along. Let's see what's going on in the next passage. The next bit, it returns us to the verse. And honestly, a good chunk of this is similar until we get down to right here, I believe. Yes. Now, fairly standard, best on from what my ears can tell and maybe others would hear differently. We're lo it looks like we're coming from a kind of standard third harmonizations right here. So you have your sort of, you know, your main tone, your root tone right here out of the harmony you're creating. You have two guitars and you're just stacking a third on top of that. Fairly basic, done many, many times, but always, always sounds cool and always, always is a great way to add some yeah, variation, some spice and some driving force to the songs that you're listening to. So that continues on for the entire verse. We now get back to the pre-chorus and I'm trying to see if anything in particular is going on different here. Doesn't look like it. So moving on to the pre-chorus right here, I actually didn't put much right here because more or less the pre-chorus is about the same as it was before. Uh, I actually I actually left this part originally how the tab was without the uh, jump to the flat three just to kind of show how there's a little bit of, you know, different stuff you can be hearing here based on who you are, how you're listening to it. So if anyone knows definitively if that jump happens, please let me know. I'd be happy to uh, make any adaptations that would be necessary to my thinking of it. But uh, yeah, I'm just going to go on forward with that for now because it doesn't look like too much else changes here. We now get into the first chorus. And this chorus is pretty freaking sweet. It basically expands the lead line that we had before. And before we get to the lead line, I want to talk a little bit about the chord progression. Now, chord progression such as this, from the flat six to the flat seven to the one to the flat seven uh, down, you know, to the one and so on. Chord progressions like like this one are, is going to be kind of the bread and butter for most of the rest of the song. Not the entire song, but a lot of it. I'm going to get a ton of mileage out of this sort of progression. It's going to be really, really cool to see how it evolves. Now, uh, taking a moment to talk about the pads just for a second. We haven't too much before. One thing that I've found very, very uh, important and unique to the sound of melodic death metal compared to some other kinds of metal is the constant use of pads to sort of underscore things, is I guess the phrase I'd use to say it. They just kind of fill things out and to make things sound a little bit more full, probably. <laughs> Why they're called pads, I suppose. Does a great job here, too. They are basically just following the chord progression, playing the root notes of each chord progression going on, and just kind of filling the sound out. And it works out really, really well. Another thing I want to point out here with the lead lines, and I annotated some of this so you can see, is while not all the time you have large points of time where the specific chord being played up top right here, the implied chord, whether that be the flat six, the flat seven, the one, are being the tones of those chords are always often being played underneath the lead line. So for example, uh, this passage right here where a C sharp minor chord is being played, this lead line right here incorporates the one and the three. That should actually be a flat three right there. A uh, one and a flat three into that chord via the lead line. They have a fourth in there as well. But, you know, again, two triad notes out of three following very closely to the chord lines you can see as well one five also four in there but one and a five and they go off the path a little bit sometimes but that's fine to add some variation point is they're sticking fairly close to the chords that are being played above top and giving us fairly clear implications for what's uh, being implied so that goes on right here it's a very nice melody it's a very cohesive sounding melody and no doubt that's because the lead lines fit so freaking well to what is being played, the chords being played underneath. So let's just go ahead and move on here just a little bit. Uh, verse 3 basically repeats in large fashion with the variation of the rhythmic pedal tone type lines being quite different. I do a lot of interesting things here. Now, one thing they do, and I actually I didn't notate any of this because it's similar to before, so the, the tabs look kind of off and weird. That's why. 
they basically start out with the harmonized thirds again, and then they move into a sort of different vari of it, variant of it, uh, some octaves higher, and they do all kinds of interesting things. And I, I double-checked this, like listening to the song, flipping my speakers on and off to see. Uh, right here, for example, they have basically an octave being played, but they have their, their pedal tone in one passage is an octave lower than their pedal tone in the other passage. I'm not sure fans do that all the time. I'm sure it more, happens more often than I would have figured, but this is the first time I've actually observed that and heard that uh, strictly and with surety, and I gotta say it's something I'm really become interested in and a cool nuance I want to go ahead and throw into my stuff. You can see right here, they don't do that for all of it, though. The pedal tones in these two parts are the same. These two parts, the pedal tones, are the same as well. And here, according to this tab, and again, the tab could be wrong, uh, there doesn't seem to be an overabundance of change at all, just uh, some slight change. So, again, pretty interesting stuff. A lot of very nice use of variation, again, and variation is really the name of the game here. It keeps people engaged. It keeps people interested, even for repeating the same general idea, which this most certainly is the same general chord structure we've been seeing in the other verses. You still have the ability to mix it up and keep your interest li uh, listener engaged, and they have that going on right here. So very, very good stuff. Also just wanted to point out the bass line uh, playing very quickly, underscoring things, and more importantly, playing an octave higher. And actually, you can hear in this song often how the bass is doing things that makes it stand out. Like right here, the bass is playing an octave higher than it was right in the portion before, right back this way. Makes it stand out, makes it jump out at you, and that's exactly what you want. This works especially well when you have your guitar is playing higher pedal tones as shown here. So moving on to the next passage, and this next passage is actually a repeat of the chorus. Does pretty much the exact same stuff as prior. Didn't really see any differences or that are bigger noteworthy. Just another really good solid chorus kind of reiterating what happened before. Now, one thing that's a pretty big doozy was this passage right here before the tapping part. Now, this is this is the bridge that comes in right before the tapping part happens where it sounds like, you know, the heavens are open and Jesus coming back down to earth and everything like that. Really interesting stuff going on here. So, first of all, I it's my opinion, and it seems pretty definitive to me that this entire song is in C-sharp minor. Looking at this passage right here, these two measures, I feel, and I would argue, that the song transitions to D-sharp minor from there, so that's a major second modulation up the guitar neck, basically, is a way to look at it. I feel like that is because, essentially, even though this chord right here has some accidentals, which is kind of a function of it just being a weird chord in general, there are less accidentals for these two measures than there would be in C-sharp minor or even the chord or um, the scale that we're going to be moving to in just a second. So just a little bit of a discussion about what's going on here. So like I said, we're modulating to D-sharp minor. And that's showing right here. Now this chord we're playing out of D-sharp minor is uh, the 4 of D-sharp minor. Now my suspicion for why we're using this chord right here is because this chord right here, G-sharp minor, is shared by both the key of C-sharp minor and the key of D sharp minor, if I'm getting that right and everything. It gives a smoother transition between things than just jumping straight out to a chord that neither key had any relation to. So that's my opinion of what's going on there. Now, despite that, there's some weirdness going on with this chord, this G7. All I can say, based on from what I can tell, is that it looks just kind of like, well, number one, it's borrowing uh, a note from the harmonic minor scale from D sharp harmonic minor is basically adding back the seven, not the flat seven, but the seven uh, back into D sharp minor in order to just give a little bit of a twinge to the sound. It also has a minor second in the chord form as well in relation to the key of D sharp minor too, which, you know, obviously the key of D sharp minor does not have a minor second interval. So again, I feel like it's probably just something that sounded good at the time and does sound good when you're listening to it and everything like that. Uh, we're trying to just basically apply music theory the best we can to it. Uh, a little bit of anomaly, but still sounds cool. Now we get into the really, what I feel is a really cool part and a really part that speaks so heavily to why this whole transition from keys sounds so uniform and so great. So 
we're still in D-sharp minor right here. Now what's being played, though, is a chord that is the flat 6 of D-sharp minor. Moving to a chord that is the flat 7 of D-sharp minor. And really quickly before going on, just wanted to point out that when coming up with these, what these chord forms are, I'm also accounting for these notes down here. We're kind of bringing in everything together, including the paths with this one. Now, moving from the flat 7 to this chord right here, which to me clearly is now in C sharp major, I feel like this kind of movement is done because moving from B to C sharp to F sharp would be moving from the flat 6 to the flat 7 to the flat 3, almost like a major movement. Here's the thing, though. This is not a flat 3. This is a flat 6. This, in my opinion, is sort of taking our expectations of moving from the flat 6 to the flat 7 to the flat 3, right? Kind of to the major sound. We're moving more to a Lydian sound, and that's shown by this sharp four happening in the tapping section right here. So just to kind of reiterate, our song up to like this part of the bridge has all been in C sharp minor. Now, after that, we transition like very for just a very short time to D sharp minor, not C sharp minor, D sharp minor right here. We have some weirdness going on with the chord that's kind of borrowing like an accidental and like a harmonic minor note. But basically, we're in D sharp minor. We then crawl up to D sharp minor to what would make us be expecting the flat three of D sharp minor, which is basically like the tonic of the major scale of the relative major. But instead, we get a bimodal switch and end up on the flat six of C sharp major and basically get a Lydian sound. It's a lot to wrap your head around and everything if you were able to follow all that. Uh, that's awesome. It took me a while to get it down and everything. That's what's going on here. I feel like that's why this song, it sounds so clear in this passage, so clear, so clean, almost like it is still in the same key because it's done so cleanly, even though it's not. It's really not at all. There's two key changes here, arguably. So anyways, super awesome stuff right here. Wanted to just kind of make that as clear as I could. Moving over into the tapping section now, I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, again, the chord progression is very, very similar as it was before. Again, we have the flat 6 to the flat 7 to the 1 to the flat 7 back to the 1 again. A little bit of a variation, but still following the same kind of thing as always. So working out there to make the song sound very, very uniform and good. Just want to see what the pads are doing really quickly right here. So, you know, if you go here and you look at them, we have basically like pads more or less kind of following what's going on with the chords above but also adding two things as well like for example we have a one in flat six right here we have a five and a flat two extensions and such so the pads still playing a very supplementary role obviously but no doubt contributing to the sort of ethereal sound that the song has at this point due to the intervals being played so moving on a little bit the tapping also we have right here we can see what's going on here we have basically a straight try with a sharp four. That is hardcore, the Lydian sound. No two ways about it. Um, we have a little bit of you know short movement here, quarter note movements from one chord to another. There are accidentals appropriately there shown a one and a four. Moving kind of quickly along some of these parts, just pointing them out and you know running past because they're kind of very very like micro passages of the song. Moving on to the uh, one, we have the one and the flat six and the four show. So you get a very Aeolian sound by having this flat six right here. You also have the four added in there, giving a little bit of a suspended sound, cool stuff. Uh, you know, if you're interested in what the specific points are for some of these other notes, you have these right here. Uh, this one corresponds to a G sharp chord with the accompanying accidentals right here. The next chord is then an A sharp seven followed by a F sharp with their accompanying accidentals here. Not wanting to spend a ton, a ton of time on that, just because, you know, we could be here all day if we're going <laughs> to nitpick what each accidental is. Wanting to move on just a little bit, but wanted to have that stuff in the videos for you guys to look at if you were so interested later on. So right after this portion, a very, very kind of percussive and heavy part comes in with the tapping still going. This, best I can tell, is, you know, about the same thing as what's up here. The same chord forms, the same movements, 
It's just repeated and it's done in palm muted fashion this time with screaming as well. So again, getting tons and tons of mileage out of just, you know, these couple like regular riffs and such. Very good stuff. If we keep moving on and try and find my scroll wheel, eventually we get to the singing portion, which in this tab, the singing parts are not included, uh, but that's all good. It's, you know, we still know it's there and everything. Once again, there's the same chords we see done in chord form this time. One thing I wanted to point out in the song is that the guitars are actually very quiet at this portion just to make like lots of room for the vocals and everything. So it's unfortunate we don't have the vocals here, but you know, we know how the song goes and stuff. We can listen to it and hear that the guitars are very subtle compared to the bass line, which as we move a little bit forward and you know, here lots of stuff's going on very quick, very snappy, very low though. As we move on throughout the singing part, we see at a point the bass becomes, well, it's always been fast. The bass gets almost kind of like tremolo with things, hitting lots of, you know, different notes outside of just what the chord is implying. And it, it's a really awesome point. It gets to the point where you hear it very, very clearly all the way to the where the bass is playing up high on the neck. Uh, I'd say this is probably one of my favorite parts of the singing passage, just the bass. Again, very much clearly showing Omnium Gatherum, giving like emphasis and just space in the mix. For the bass to really come out and show itself because while bass is important in every song it, you don't always have the bass kind of clearly front and center in some passages of the song like it is right here so super happy to have that clear right here it's really good stuff so wanting to move on to what i would call the last interlude just seeing if anything is kind of worth pointing out here looking over some of the chords they're definitely looking familiar and everything like that um one thing I'd say about the song itself, like like the actual track, is that best I can tell, it's either this portion or the next. The tapping part is in one side of the speakers, basically panned far over to one side. And the lead line, which is similar to the other chorus lead lines, is on another side. Really tight stuff right there. I don't often hear bands do things like that where they let sort of a separate, you know, kind of solo or lead line completely different occupy different sides of the stereo field but it's done here it's very cool um th this is all very similar to what's been done before so i haven't annotated it much in terms of music theory i just wanted to point that out because i thought it was kind of tight so let's move on right to the final part where the screaming comes in again we have the exact same chords as we've had in the past i didn't annotate them here with the specific uh, intervals but they are definitely having the same kind of progression here. Once again, just getting mileage all the way up to the end with it. It's amazing what you can do if you got a good enough progression and can make it interesting. One thing I wanted to really underscore here is that once again, you have the lead line very, very closely following the chords that are heard in the lower rhythm lines. You know, in this, in this, in this section right here, for example, these three notes, you're playing a one, a two, and a six, uh, which actually is pretty cool because all together with the pads and such, and I forget where exactly it is, but basically a two is implied throughout all of this stuff put together. You have the first note of this lead line right here actually bending up to the two, to the major second extension, really kind of fleshing that out. And it just, it sounds really great. I always love it. I, you know, I love this whole song, but when this line comes in, it, it's extra good. It feels so refreshing and beautiful, and I just love it. Here we kind of get to more what I was talking about a little bit a second ago. We have the one, the three, and the four. We have a four in there, but again, the one and the three very closely following what's going on with the chords being played underneath. We have a four and a five here as well. We go a little bit off by having a two and a flat seven here, but then there's other portions like this where we have just a three kind of being held out the entire time going along with its chord, which in this case is an F sharp. So just going to scroll ahead to see if there's anything else I wanted to talk about here. Music theory wise, you can see a little bit more over here, what some of the accidentals are doing. Basically chord tone soloing, uh, chord tone, uh, playing chord tones over the rhythmic stuff going on. So we have this, this is kind of the outro. I didn't annotate anything here because it's very, very similar to what we were just discussing a little bit ago. But this idea of adhering very closely to chord forms definitely is continued on here as the song kind of fades out. And although it's not shown here, there's some 
cool, subtle stuff done with like a whammy bar just to really close out the song and really leave it on a sick note. So, yeah, that is New Dynamic by Omnium Gatherum. Absolutely love this song. Super, super cool stuff. I hope you guys got something out of looking at it. I know I learned a lot, and I mean like a lot from looking over and analyzing it. Definitely got some tricks that I'm going to want to go ahead and apply to my own music writing and my own guitar playing. Hope you guys did too. Y'all, if there was any song you want me to try to cover for the next analysis video that's in the vein of melodic death metal, metalcore, something along those lines, go ahead and let me know in the comments. I'll be totally down to check it out. And please remember, if you like what you saw, keep it right here at The Spike Signal.